Hi right, folks, uh, this is Isaac. Um, this is episode seven. In this one, we talk about uh, Bruce's teacher, Wong Xu Jing, and his training with uh, Wong, and some of the origins of some of the material from Energy Gates a little bit more. Also, we get into some of the tips on standing and how to build awareness while you're standing. Uh, just a side note, you know, I know everybody's stuck at home and this is kind of a bummer time. Um, so, you know, try to stay positive, wash your hands, stay healthy, take your vitamins, keep up your practice. Um, we're going to be releasing these as on schedule as we can. Um, we've got about six more recorded, so we should be good for the next few months. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying it. If you are, let us know. Um, I'm available for online lessons. If anyone's interested, you can reach me through the website. Uh, take care. So picking up where we left off on opening the energy gates of your body, we've been uh, looking at the biography um, that Bruce Kumar Francis tells the story of his experiences in martial arts. And then we're also looking at some of the step-by-step uh, -step procedure for doing the set. Um, we left off here in his, after uh, spending time in Japan, he uh, went on a trip to visit Taiwan. So there's a section called Taiwan, the astonishing Wang Shujin. So another experience pointed in the direction of China when Kumar visited Taiwan in 1968. There he met Wang Shujin, an internal martial arts master from the city of Changjin. Wang was in his 70s and at 5 foot 8 overweight and 250 plus pounds. Nevertheless, he proved to be a physically quicker than the much younger Kumar, who he could knock or throw around the room at will. Which is pretty funny. There's a, there's a number of uh, fight stories in here that are really cool and tell his, you know, his adventures meeting different martial artists in Taiwan. Um, but uh, I think, you know, Master Wong ended up making a big impression on him. I think we heard before about Kenichi Sawai and the standing training and Taiki Ken they used to do in Japan. But uh, here in Taiwan, he experiences another teacher that really influenced him. Well, I think Wang Shijing was his, um, you know, he always considered him his first internal martial arts teacher mm. or his main teacher. And I think that, you know, while he learned stuff with other people like, like, um, like Cho, but he really didn't, you know, grasp it or whatever until he was with Wong. I think that, you know, Wong kind of took him under his wing a little bit too, I think. So, continuing on with this profile of Master Wong, in their first conversation, Wong maintained that karate had inferior fighting technique and insists that actual prolonged karate practice would make your body old and damaged before it's time. So he, he, you know, Master Wong insults him right from the start and tells him karate doesn't work. I had a little bit of <laughs> strong opinions on that. I right. Think, yeah. I mean, you can, you know, if you spend time in Chinese martial arts, you can feel the sense of rivalry or dislike between Chinese martial arts and Japanese martial arts in some places. Not that it's not as big a deal as maybe it was yeah. 30, 50 years ago, but nowadays... But there's still a sense, you know, both both countries have pride in their martial arts, so, it you know, that's always going to be a thing, especially for these World War II guys like Master Wong. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, sure. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting history there for sure. So, the next paragraph, Kumar recalls that he only ended up hurting his hands and feet on various parts of Wong's body, and he especially remember Wong's disconcerting habit of ending up behind him several times during the fight, tapping him on the shoulder. So uh, this older man's able to, you know, easily outmaneuver him, even though he's a young karate champion at the time. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of those for, you know, everyone that does internal martial arts. At some point, you know, you meet that older person that looks completely benign and, you know, clumsy or whatever. And then next thing you know, they're spanking you over the top of the head and you're like, wait, what? So, right. I mean, it just goes to show that sometimes people look odd, but they have good training. Yeah, you know? no, I mean, and, you know, truly cannot judge a book by its cover when it comes to internal martial arts. Absolutely. Because we've encountered some oddball over the years who are, when you cross hands with them, you're surprised at how strong, how capable they can be internally connected, even if they're not lined up exactly straight. Yeah, I mean, I could name a whole bunch of people, you know. That, <laughs> 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 All right, so after the sparring match, uh, Kumar began to practice at Wong's 5 a.m. class in Taichung Park. So it sounds like that's when he started getting into the training Five, in, uh, that's early. in uh, Taiwan. And I believe, you know, standing practice has got to be a part of what they were doing at 5 a.m. in the morning. Right, well, I think that, uh, Marnix told us that 
every class started with, you know, half an hour of standing with the arms up in the air, you know, six postures, you know, or six 15 minutes each yeah, or something. Or five like minutes that. each, you know, uh-huh. half hour total, and then you'd go into whatever it was. You know, and that's how Bruce's class was, were, you know, in the early days. It was like, it didn't matter what you were doing. Usually, you know, maybe it was only a couple minutes, but you almost always just started with standing. I mean, um, and I think that's why we do it. It's just, you know, it's it's kind of ingrained in it. You know, it's something like that. just, it's the, it doesn't take long, but just doing it for a couple minutes kind of gets everything online and you're like in your body a little bit more and then you're ready to like do, you know, whether it's sparring or doing forms or whatever, you know, but you're, you're just a little bit more engaged in your system. And I think that's what all these guys, you know, they all talk about that, like that, the, you know, the, the thing you get from standing is that awareness of your body and that is invaluable when it comes to... And that awareness leads to a bit of a wholeness where yeah. you're able to move with more strength. I don't want to call it strength, but for instance, when you're doing standing for a while, when someone crashes into you, they bounce off you more than they used to. Yeah, right? you know, There's a stability to it. There's yeah. You could call it strength or power, but it's more like unification sure. seems to be the word that works best. Yeah, and I think all of those you know things describe essentially different aspects of the same... Thing. I mean, if that's where you get a lot of this stuff. It's, you know, it's hard to describe what internal things feel like. I mean, by their very nature, they're, you know, they're internal. They're not physical. So it's like, you know, there's a that's the Taoist thing of you know the the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. You know, the the piece the way you describe dissolving to someone is never going to quite. You know, even no matter how good you describe it, it's never going to quite be that thing. Just like, you know, you can't describe to somebody what it feels like to get punched in the face. You know, it's like you can, you know, you can say, well, go, you know, smack yourself in the chin, but it's not going to be not the, same. the same. It's not the same. You know, and it's just, it's just, you know, there's a, that's the experiential part of all this stuff. I think that's really important. So Wang Shijin's clearly a big influence on on Kumar when he gets to Taiwan. And so we, we decided to take a look at Master Wong's book, uh, Bagua Linked Palms, uh, translated by Kent Howard. Um, a really interesting book that translates one of Master Wong's old books. And there's, there's only a little bit of standing advice in the book. Chapter 4, Bagua Zhang Post-Standing Methods. Post-standing is the most fundamental skill of martial arts practice. The more you stand, the more stable your foundation will be. Post-standing is called primordial or universal standing. And then he goes on to list a number of stances. Yeah, right? well, there I you mean, go. Mm-hmm. The more you stand, the better you'll get. That's, that's pretty much is the most fundamental skill of martial arts practice. So, like, wouldn't you think maybe punching a punching bag well, that, or, yeah, that, you know, something like that would be the most fundamental right, skill? I mean, well, that's Wang Shi Jing's whole deal. I mean, uh, you know, the, I, I think the idea that if you make yourself essentially impervious to other people's strikes. What does it matter how good they are? You know, it's like, it's just like a three-year-old hitting you in the leg, you know, it's like, it doesn't do much. Right. And, and that standing, you know, it just, it's just interesting to me that such a quiet, calm activity that can enrich you and form a foundation for either martial arts or for Qigong or for meditation and yet here is someone reputed to be a pretty invulnerable fighter saying that this is fundamental as martial arts practice. Sure, I mean, you know, I'm not going to argue with him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, took challenge matches yeah, take his, into his 80s. Take his word for it. Yeah. So it's called primordial or universal standing. I don't know the Chinese that they're translating that from, but... Well, I think, you know, Bruce, the universal post is often mm. used as a term, so I think that's probably the same, you know, or similar... And I, does that speak to that sense of feeling unified we've been talking about, or is it something more cosmic than that? Well, I mean, I think the whole idea of a post, right? What does a post do? It's it's a thing that connects some, a top and a bottom, you know. It, it, so it's one piece. And I think, you know, the idea that standing is essentially to make your body like one, you know, one thing, like a big pole. You know, it's a column is it, maybe a better word, you know, that, that you're... You're the conduit between gravity and the ground. You know, the, the, the forces coming through you are not impeded by your sh- own structure. Your own tension isn't blocking the... Yeah, your, ten- your own tension or, you know, or anything. Right? The 
could be, you know, your, if your knee alignment is out, right, that's going to limit your structure, you know. So I think ultimately all these, all these things are alluding to the fact that without structure, you know, martial arts aren't going to be very effective, you know. That makes sense. And, I'll and neither is anything else you do. I mean, you know, you start, forget martial arts. Talk about, you know, woodworking or gardening or, you know, anything where you have to use your body. Uh, it's going to work better if your knee doesn't, like, break every time you put weight on it. <laughs> right. And Kent makes a note here um, that post standing does not, however, appear to be a universal practice in other Baguajang styles. Wang Shijin had his students stand in the postures at the beginning of every practice session, regardless of what he was teaching. Yeah, well, I think that goes to the that it isn't a big part of Wagua, and that what he was really doing was making everybody do a little bit of qigong standing or like shimi standing before they did Bagua. And Bruce did the same thing. I mean, right? I mean, that's a connection um, there in the teaching style. Yeah, the, I mean, absolutely. I would say. Bruce's teaching style mimics, you know, Wang Shu Jing and Hung Shang more than Leo or, you know, that, that sort of more private type of teaching. You know, he's very much, you know, like when he would teach stuff, you could almost feel him channeling their, you know, repeating the things that they said to him when he was learning it and taking on their kind of cadence when he would talk, you know, when he would do the ER songs uh, stuff, you know, it was like it, 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 it was exactly like you know the way you know, they did it. So I think yeah, you know, gravelly, yeah, Chinese. you're just kind of channeling your teacher's essence, you know. I mean, I think everybody you can't help it. No, I think it, you know, it's an unconscious thing, you know, on a lot of levels, but everybody does it. I mean, it's it's part of the transmission, I think. Yeah, each generation takes on some of the characteristics of their own teachers, so. And that's why digging into this stuff from Taiki Ken and from uh, Master Wong's Bagua class, like, it's interesting to see these threads that travel from, you know, his early training through the way well, he taught and our right. training together, you know? It's all the little streams that sort of, you know, fed into what later became the, the, the quote-unquote, the system, you know? Right. Right. And so that's, you know, it's fun to dig into those a little bit. So. For sure. Anyways, uh... So just to finish up his chapter here about Taiwan and the astonishing Wang Shijin, he, he started the 5 a.m. class. He got by, beat up by an old man, then he got beat up by an old lady. Classic. Um, and now he was starting to question his training up till that point. But uh, well, uh, you know, I mean, I think if you if you th you think of yourself as a you know a proficient fighter, and then you get beat up by a sixty year old woman, you know that's not a, now. Yeah. She, she, could, could she might that. she could be you know badass yeah she's you know so yeah I, mean, I think that's a so one of, he tells a story of talking to some of the older students there and trying to figure out what drew them to the practice and he was saying you know he talked to an old man who had a spine problem and when he practiced after a couple of years he felt so much better he quit practicing then the old man's symptoms recurred after a few months hmm. and so that's one of the lessons he passes on is this is the idea of Using, you know, qigong and martial arts to rehabilitate yourself, to straighten your body, to strengthen your body, and that you, it's not a one-time fix. Well, I think that was, a that was a with all his teachers, a, a main theme, if you will, is that the, the healing aspects of doing internal martial arts, you know, that, it, yes, it's a martial art and it's about learning how to fight, but it's also the process of doing that should be making your body stronger and healthier, not weaker and sicker, you know, and so... And with injuries. Yeah, and so, you know, <clears throat> I think they did it in different ways. I mean, I think uh, <clears throat> Wang Shu Jing was more on the um, Qigong meditation side. Hang Shang was more on the, you know, Tui Na and uh, physical movements rehabilitation, but, they, you know, they all had a way of using internal martial arts um you know as a as a medical practice and i think bruce definitely carried that over into the energy gates you know system um so just to finish the biographical experience here uh it sounds like kumar went back to tokyo up until 1971 uh he can he pursued his study of the internal arts with the shingi master kenichi suai and with various students of wang shujin they had in japan right we mentioned last time. so he's speaking of cho sensei uh his right. other teacher there 
Um, and he talks about getting into body work um, and doing massage. Um, then he went on a trip to Okinawa, and it ends with, he came to the realization that caused him to give up study of the purely external hard styles for good. From this point on, he focused all his efforts solely on the internal martial arts and Qigong. He talked a lot about how giving up external martial arts was sort of a, a big thing because you had to make the choice of, you know, am I going to train things to do my to keep my physical body strong or am I going to give up on that sense of strength and pursue this more, you know, whatever, more amorphous kind of power that, you know, Wang Shu Jing and these, this old lady that just beat my ass have, <laughs> you know. Um, and, you know, and I think it must have been hard, you know, coming from a lifetime of external martial arts where everything is about faster, stronger, harder to, you know, something where it's much more about sensitivity and softness. I mean, my first class, you know, when he asked, you know, what would you rather have, a hard body or a soft body? I blurted out hard, you know, thinking like, <laughs> right. you know, and everyone's like, who's this doofus, you know? So, you know, I think it's just a, it's a paradigm shift, especially when you're young, you know, even if you don't come from that kind of world, but, you know, especially coming from that, it's got to be a total mindfuck. <laughs> so continuing where we left off with the uh, standing postures training um, here in lesson two, we've been looking at the helpful hints for awakening your chi. Um, the next one is let your nerves come alive. So this one's a pretty big one because that's that sense of not just sort of passively occupying your body, but if you can help your nerves come a while alive, you're f able to feel more sense more and enjoy your body more even like be more present within it. If the nerves are more alive. Well, and I think, you know, nerves are the precursor to feeling things like chi, you know, that, that a lot of what you you know, in the initial practice is just wake up your nerves so that, in the sense they can have a better, you know, you have a better sense of what you're feeling, right? I mean, your nerves are the antenna for everything else that you're feeling. So, um, you know, he would often talk about um, the blood, the breath, and the mm. nerves, right? Right. That those were sort of the, the three access points to, you know, quote-unquote chi, um, which I really think is just a code name for a sense of feeling everything at once, or, you know, as much of it as you can at once. So the sense of unification that, that that frequently gets talked about leads you to feeling this wholeness that is, you know, um, part of, you know, this inherent thing that all human beings have, but nobody can really put their finger on what it is, you know. And so you use a process like, like scanning your energy body to let the nerves come alive, and thereby sort of experience this heart, you know, this in, inbuilt sense of unity that's in there. Yeah, somewhere. I think the nerves are just, you know, the they're they're the physical thing that allows you to feel, right? I mean, they're they're an actual, you know, part of your body that if you improve their function, you feel, you know, more, more. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say feel better, but sometimes you actually feel worse because you're just <laughs> feeling more of what's there, and if it's not what you, you know, it's not great. Then he says that so that we have a wide range of ability to sense nerve awareness, and it can grow a lot. And don't be frustrated if you can't feel much at first. In time, you will be able to feel. Yeah, and that's well, a good instruction because I, yeah, I mean, you I, never know if you're fooling yourself because you're like, hey, wait, am I really feeling, or am I just picturing that feeling? Well, and that's where I think nerves are, a, you, you know, even that one, what does a nerve feel like? I mean, people have different experiences of it, but usually as things begin to wake up, you get sensations like tingling or heat or, you know, buzzing. And those are usually, those are the senses of your nerves waking up. And then as that kind of hits a plateau of being a bit calmer, you start to notice things, you know, sort of underneath that. Um, but, you know, they create, they create this interference at first, and then later they're the, you know, tool with which you feel more. So it's Maybe of, that's some of the pain that Kenichi so right, said. Yeah, you feel the pain when you're that, standing. That's yeah. that feeling of nerves. Right. Any sensation. Is, taking, but but yeah. clearly pain is going to be the, the predominant one in the beginning because, you know, the minute most people stop and go inside, what's the first thing you know? You start feeling where your shoulders hurt, your knees hurt, 
you know, your back or you feel the imbalances in your body. And so I think what, what he's saying in a sense is don't fight that sense of mm. feeling all these different things. Just allow yourself to feel all this different stuff and not have any like, you know, predetermined notions of what you're supposed to do with it. Just allow it to be there and, you know, let it wake up. Mm. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, for me, it was it was a long time ago. You probably had a more recent experience of what it was like to, you know, as a beginner to learn standing. But I think everybody goes through it, you know, in their own way. So, absolutely, no, I couldn't agree more. It's, and I'd like, you know, letting your nerves come alive is just one of the one just the key things to keep in mind while you train. It's it's going to something to keep a lookout for, and you'll experience it. Yeah, and it's like, you know, it's a, not necessarily a low bar, but it's an easy bar to maintain. So rather than trying to feel some super subtle amorphous thing, it's like, well, pick something you can actually, like, you know, identify. Right, just clap work. your hands together. There's your nerves. Right. Your nerves aren't something far exactly. away that's hard to feel. You know? yeah. And so these are, this, is, this type of standing is going to help other nerves wake up that are kind of dormant and numb and kind of asleep. And so the next one, you know, there's the nerves is the physical body, but the next one is keep the mind stable. So I'm not, that's the mind training of, of this practice. Right, Energy that's... body scanning is not essentially a physical or an intellectual exercise. It is an exercise in specifying, refining, and increasing the life force energies in the body. I mean, that's what they would refer to as the E, right? The, the, the mind, the, the intent, right? How, how strong is your intent? Because... If your mind is wavering and drifting and wandering to shopping lists and things like that, it's hard to do this kind of practice. And so a big part of what you're developing in the beginning is just, you know, the, well, the strength of mind to just hold your attention on doing this practice and not, not like, um, drift off and, you know, start thinking about other things or analyzing what you're doing too much or, you know, whatever it is in order to Whatever you're projecting. Right, so the very act of paying attention develops your ability to pay attention. It's like right. it's you're lifting these weights that are making you stronger by doing it. Yeah. And he says in that paragraph, gradually this practice increases your attention span, concentration, and sensitivity to subtle energies. Yeah, well, I think, again, this is that thing that Kenichi Sawai said about things maturing over time, you know, that, that it's just a patience you know just keep at it and keep you know keep plugging away at it eventually these things will appear and you know the the i don't know if it's a bummer part of it but you know that there's no way to tell if it's going to happen quickly if it's going to happen slowly so you just have to be patient and you know not worry about it and it'll, it'll come when it comes you know i agree i think that there's you know, one of the experiences you have standing is that your mind wanders and then you come back to it and then your mind wanders and then you come back to it and you feel sure so many different feelings, so many different thoughts, you know, things just come and go. I think maybe that's the cloudiness he was speaking of where just stuff is drifting through your mind and stuff you've thought of before again and again. And it, over time, I felt like as, as my skill and standing grew, those thoughts came and went, but they distracted me less. And I was able to be a little more present, a little more stable and a little more appreciative, you know, rather than just chasing the thoughts, I'm able to soak in some of the environment we're standing in, especially on Tank Hill, when we could see a beautiful sunset or, you know, clouds changing. Instead of chasing my thoughts, I was able to break free from that and actually just be here now and enjoy being alive a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's the, the part of it, you know, where it's essentially about waking your body up so that it becomes more alive. And so you have moments where just stopping it, acknowledging that your body feels a little bit more alive in the moment is nice. But there's also the piece about the minute that you stop and acknowledge it in the moment, you're not doing the practice anymore. So it's, it's this... You know, what Bruce would always say is it's nice to have those moments, but don't make those moments the whole, you know, don't make them important. You know, don't, don't give them any, um, don't think you're special because you have a moment of clarity where you mm. feel like things are, it's just all of these things that are feel that you're feeling and that you're experiencing, you know, the, the, 
the essential piece is just to allow them to move through you, right? So, and again, this is a this is the especially if you don't know what it is part because all of that stuff, whether it's your thoughts about how great you are at it or how much you suck at it or what you're going to do next, those are all layers of this stuff that's going on as you dissolve. And so on one level, you're like trying to feel all this stuff and it's a million things at once. On another layer, it's just letting your mind kind of settle into, let's just see what all this stuff is about and not not worry that all these things are disconnected or that don't feel right and to just kind of let it all gel into one thing. So it stops being, you know, the million little things of the monkey mind and it just becomes all these crazy ass things that are happening are my mind, right? Because everything that you're experiencing in your body, you're experiencing it through your mind. And so just to just that one piece about going, okay, I'm gonna just relax into the fact that, you know, I am all of these things and it's okay to feel all this stuff. But you know, and then when you go into it, you're not gonna freak out that things aren't, you know, any particular way it's almost like you stop judging what's happening yeah definitely i mean um the blank slate analogy right that if you just go into it with sort of a you know nothing is good or bad it's just um you know it is what it is you know yeah and things are different and it's just you know accept them for what they are and move on so looking at the next part of the uh, tips here, the need for rapid perfection slows progress. Mm. Um, you know, only the rarest of human beings can do these exercises correctly in the beginning. And yeah. I mean, I can speak to that because, you know, I, I came into it and I've had some training when I first did it. But I feel like you were talking about the layers of the onion. You know, at first I felt like within a few <coughs> weeks I could do it all. But at the same time, I was just beginning. And then. After a few more weeks, I felt like I was doing it all wrong. So I've had to sort of remake it. And each time I've maybe discovered a place where I was overstretching, overstretching and injuring myself, or maybe there was a point where I was tilting that I didn't realize, I've had to remake the practice again and again. And it's never going to be perfect. I think that it's the, the onion layers again, right? The, you know, the first layer of the onion is learn the physical movements, right? The second layer of the onion is feel your body while you do the physical movements and you know at at each layer you sort of discover a different quality of you know tension or whatever it is in your body and so you know things that you know feel good on one level might later on you might notice that oh I'm actually you know that feels good quote unquote because I'm holding a whole bunch of tension somewhere in my body and you know, when I let go of that tension, I lose the sense of it feeling good, and it just feels like part of the rest of the movement, right? And so things lose their judgment quality of good or bad, and they're just, you know, they're just there. So the very last one of the uh, suggestions here under uh, helpful hints, beware of false feelings of strength. Mm. To most people, a sense of strength is a very positive and useful thing, something to be valued. However, a feeling of strength is sometimes found where energy has built up due to blockages, blockages which prevent the normal, healthy, steady flow of energy from circulating in a relaxed, powerful fashion. Yeah, I think that's the, like, the, especially it seems like more for, for men because, you know, strength is such a big thing, but uh, physical, you know, power and stuff, um, that it's hard to let go of that feeling of strength, right? To, to trust that there's some other thing that you can use to be strong, to be powerful, right? You know, this is the, the, the power of the yin, right? That, the you know, when you let go of your feeling of strength, you actually become strong because you're not holding on to this false sense of stability. So feeling of strength isn't necessarily strength. No, I think it's the opposite of strength. I mean, this is especially, you know, true of Tai Chi where, you know, in those moments where you feel like you're strong, what you really are is, you know, unstable and about to fall over. Um, in the moments when you're actually, you know, stable, you don't feel much of anything. You just, you know, you're just in the movement. And I think that's the same with standing is that when it's going good, you don't feel much. You just kind of, you know, your mind is just moving through your body and there's no restriction. 
when it's not going so well, you're feeling all of these things, and every little thing you feel seems like a big thing. You know, it's the princess and the pea kind of thing, where you 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 feel this little thing in your shoulder, and you know your mind interprets as this. You know, I'm probably dying of cancer, and you know, <clears throat> so that, that that piece of just you know seeing things for what they are and not putting a lot of judgment on them is, I think, a, a real important part of how you approach standing, not necessarily what you do when you stand. All right, well, those are good talking to you. Good tips. That's episode seven. No one that can. All right. Hey, folks, Isaac again. Uh, just one last thing. I am not doing any in-person classes, but I'm working on doing some Zoom lessons for my weekly classes and possibly for the workshops. So if you're interested, uh, drop me a line, let me know. All right, take care and like and subscribe. Cheers.